Last week we started, well actually several weeks ago we started talking about prayer. And we started talking about prayer from the Lord's Prayer because the Lord gave this to us as a model and specifically as an example of what our prayer life should include. You know, I, I hope and pray that your prayer life is alive and that it's growing. Without spending time with Jesus, we're lost. And we really have no hope of resisting temptation or living in the power of God that we need to make it in this world system. And when I say a prayer life, I'm not just talking about uttering a quick sentence of, Lord, help me, or help this, or Lord, you know, get me out of this problem. We're talking about us really taking time to be before Father, to be quiet before His presence, and to not only articulate our needs and our heart, but also to take time to listen to what He would say. And so, unless we're taking that time, we're not going to be changed. We're not going to be living in the power that we need to live in. And so we started off here talking about the different elements of prayer that are supposed to be in our prayer life. Our Father, which art in heaven. What a miracle we said that is, that prayer unites heaven and earth as one. Without prayer, God would be in heaven, we'd be here on the earth, but through the new birth, thank God that we are now one spirit with the Lord, and we can pray, and in that prayer life, we, are, we can live as though we are seated with Him in heavenly places, because in God's heart and mind, we really are. Aren't you glad you're not bound? We're no longer prisoners to this life, we're no longer prisoners to this world system but we have a heavenly life. We have a heavenly Father. Powers and principalities tremble at the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. And as we go to God in prayer, we have that heavenly perspective, the heavenly power, the heavenly life that so far transcends anything in this world system that we face. Our Father which art in heaven. Thank God He made the way for heaven and earth to become one. And it's through prayer. And then we said, hallowed be thy name. Worship has got to be a part of your prayer life. Worship is the reboot. Worship is the reset button. As you're there worshiping God, He once again is placed upon the throne of your heart as Lord and Master. And we kneel before Him as His servant, as His love slave. And so worship just puts everything back into perspective. Worship gets our focus off of us and onto God. Worship gets our focus off the circumstances, off this earth life, and gets our focus back on to Him. Hallowed be Thy name. Worship is vital. He deserves our worship and our praise. Verse 10, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This element, we talked about it, is the element of surrender. Surrender to His will. We see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating drops of blood coming to that place of absolute surrender. That's how difficult your fight against self-will is. And we won't be able to surrender to God's will and God's Word without first surrendering in prayer. You never get to the obedience of the cross without the surrender of Gethsemane. The surrender is birthed in prayer. And then, as you come out of prayer, that surrender works itself out in your daily routine. But surrender always must first start in prayer before His throne as you surrender your heart and your will. And then in the power of that surrender of Gethsemane, then you can bear the cross that you're bearing in your life. And so, this place of coming to absolute surrender, of bowing before His throne, one of the most important parts of prayer. And then we're talking, we started last week about give us this day our daily bread, and we're going to finish that up today. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So today we want to finish up on this topic, our daily bread. And we said there that the way this is phrased in the original language, that word 
daily really stands out in the way that it was written. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not give us this day tomorrow's bread, but give us this day the daily bread, what we need today to survive, what we need today to live. And this part of prayer, I'll just say it again, I, us Americans really have a hard time even relating to this. I mean, we, when you think about it, the poorest one here in the room is richer than 75, 80% of the rest of the world. We have so much stuff, right? I mean, what other nations have, uh, you know, reality shows about those, what are they, the hoarders, what are they called? Is it hoarders or, right? And you walk into their house and, it, I mean, the stuff is piled from floor to sea. I mean, what, what other nation gets that ridiculous with the stuff that we acquire? And we're going to see it again, but the, the most dangerous part of having access to all this stuff and all this food, you know, we probably have enough food in our refrigerators to last the next two weeks if we really had to live off of it, is that we forget about every day trusting God for our provision. And it robs us of that faith. You know, we saw how in the, uh, in the wilderness, Israel was put to the test. And manna came every morning, and they went out and gathered it. And if they tried to keep it for tomorrow, what happened? It stank, it rotted, worms ate it, right? And God was teaching them, I am your provision. Your next breath comes from me. Your next heartbeat comes from me. I want you to trust me every day. And so the whole journey in the wilderness, one big part of what God was teaching them in the wilderness is we have to trust him every day. And the society that we, lived in, that we live in, unfortunately, has robbed us of that blessing. We don't know what it means to trust God every day because we have enough to live for many days. And so this whole thing of daily bread, I put there, daily bread necessitates the exercise of daily trust. Every day your trust is getting a workout, believing for him. In the surplus of abundance, faith is not exercised and it grows weak. Daily bread teaches us of our utter dependence upon God for our very next breath, heartbeat, and sustenance. Our culture and the world system teaches us of pride and independence. We're going to see that at the end where, you know, that parable uh, that Jesus gave about the man who went out and built bigger barns. And there's one phrase in that parable when the man said he would go out and build a bigger barn to store all of this stuff. And the one phrase in there that's critical is, so take thy ease. I have enough to provide for the rest of my life. And we live in a society of pensions and 401ks. There's nothing wrong with it, nothing wrong with saving for the future. We've got to stay balanced. But yet we'll see at the end... The tragic thing that happens in our heart is we begin to trust in that 401k and we trust in the pension and we trust in social security and our faith is not being exercised to depend upon God. Daily bread teaches us of God's limitless love. He loves you. We'll review that quickly again where Jesus said, take no thought for the morrow. If God takes care of the birds the way that he does, have you ever seen an anorexic bird? You know, maybe if it's sick, but typically you don't see an anorexic bird. They're, God feeds every bird, every animal. And Jesus says, don't you know that he loves you so much more? His incomprehensible omniscience. He knows. He knows what you're going through. He, he knows the worry in your heart. He knows every need. No detail is too small for him. Nothing escapes his attention. You have a God who's intimately involved in the details of your life. His unfailing faithfulness, he's always faithful. He's always there. He always provides the need. The righteous have never been forsaken. They have never begged for bread, the scripture teaches. His minute involvement. Isn't it wonderful to see how God just arranges the details of your life? And in his sovereignty, things just start to we would use the word magically come together, but they're just supernaturally in his plan. And 
He orders things so faithfully in our lives. Daily bread teaches us that we can trust God with tomorrow. We don't need to worry or fear. This is something that I have to review in my heart continually. Because I can, I, I do get worried about the future. Will we have enough to make it to the end of our life here? Is our savings big enough? Do we have enough in the pension plan? Do we? And Jesus says this, take no thought. Not even one thought of worry for tomorrow. Let God take care of tomorrow. Daily bread teaches us that what we store and provide for tomorrow can and will fail. You know, in the, in the time that we're living in right now, let me just say two things. One thing is, I'm not teaching this because I'm trying to increase Westgate Chapel's offerings. That has nothing to do with it. That didn't even enter into my mind, still doesn't enter into my mind. You guys are very loving, very faithful givers, and I thank God for you every day. I really do. And so this has nothing to do with the organization of Westgate Chapel. But I do believe that this teaching is crucial for us in the day and the age that we live in. You know, I, I remember growing up as a little boy back in the 60s, and my parents had this 19-inch black and white TV. And I still remember as a little boy watching the race riots down in D.C. and watching the stores burn. And have you noticed the increase in civil unrest here recently in the past year? I mean, it, it, it hasn't been this way since the 60s. And America right now is on the verge of civil war. We're on the verge of political um, anarchy. When the president says, we will bring in this many Syrian refugees, and over 30 of our governors say, not in our state. That's a, that's a kind of a civil war just brewing under the surface. With our financial, the economic system right now, it, my gosh, it wouldn't take much at all to cause a collapse just like that. We better know how to operate in the provision of God. And we better have the faith of daily bread. Because we don't have any guarantees that what we have now will be there tomorrow. This nation's in trouble, and that's a lot of what uh, Dr. Reagan will talk about tonight as we finish up that video. But I do believe that America is, is under the judgment of God. And we become Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is not going to let America escape judgment if he didn't let Sodom and Gomorrah escape judgment. And so, this give us this day our daily bread. We're talking about something that your life depends upon. We must have this faith in God, our provider, and our heart cannot be set on any natural source of provision or income. And so we looked at Exodus chapter 16 last week about the daily bread and how God ministered it to them every morning, and if, if they tried to store up for tomorrow, I'm just going to save this so that, you know, tomorrow I'm assured of having something. And see, when, when you take something and say, I'm going to save this up so that I know I have something for tomorrow, right there your faith in God has been robbed. That's one day you don't get to exercise it in the provision of the Lord. We talked about the eternal danger of prosperity, and one thing I wanted to say this week that's very necessary to remember it's God that causes us to prosper. Prosperity is a gift from God. But just like many gifts, our gifts, you know, when, when God gifts someone with a very beautiful singing voice or he gifts someone with, you know, a, a, the genius intellect to know how to invent something or put something together, or when God gifts a person, a lot of times that gift can become a source of pride and it can ruin them. And it's no different with prosperity. God wants to prosper us. He wants to daily load us with benefits. But many times that gift can become a great stumbling block to our hearts. And we need to guard it. And he says here, it's the Lord that is blessing you and causing you to prosper in this land. And it says in verse 10, and you shall eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. 
Bless who? The Lord. Don't think it's your merit or your skill set or your goodness that has caused this prosperity. It's God who blesses. Take care lest you what? Forget the Lord. You know, when, when you have a month's worth of groceries in the cabinets, you, it's easy to forget the Lord because you don't have to trust Him and believe Him for today. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His rules and His statutes which command you this day. Then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. You forget what He's done for you. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may confirm His covenant, that He may establish His covenant. One of the things we need to remember is that God blesses you not to keep it, but to give it. God blesses you so that you can be a giver. God never meant for you to build bigger barns. He means for you to be a conduit to bless others. That's why God prospers us. And when we forget that we are simply a conduit and God blesses us so that we can bless others, and when we start to save and store up, that's when we fall into, uh, under the curse of prosperity. And we're no longer trusting in the Lord. We think it's my power and the might of my hand that's brought me this prosperity. Never has been, never will be. It's all from God. He says, and look at this, verse 19, if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely, what? Perish. If you forget the God, your provider, and if you start to trust in your bank account, and if you start to trust in your charge limits, and if you start to trust in your pension, if you start to trust in your employment or your resume or your skill set, and if you forget that God and God alone is the provider of your daily bread and every breath and every heartbeat, you're going to perish just like the nations do. Remember we put, talked about this last week, prosperity breeds independence. Prosperity brings a false pride of I've got this under control. I can take care of myself. And if something breaks or something happens, I've got some money set aside to take care of it. And the dependence upon God is gone. Prosperity breeds that pride. And ultimately, as he was saying there, it breeds that rebellion. You know what? I'm the master of my life. I'm taking care of things. I can provide for myself. I can be my own God. And so prosperity can be a very dangerous trap if we're not careful. We said last week, we either live in God's kingdom of provision or we live in the world's kingdom of finance. Now, what would you rather live in? He says here, it's very clear in Matthew 6, verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Money. And so there's two kingdoms. Remember how he said in, uh, I believe it's Ephesians, it might be Colossians, that God has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and he's translated us into what? The kingdom of his dear son. So we're no longer living in the earth kingdom, we're now living in the heavenly kingdom, having left the earth kingdom behind and turned our backs on it. And you know what? That, that correlates into the financial realm as well. I'm no longer under the limitations or the condition of the financial world. <laughs> Which, Thank God for that because it's not in real good shape right now. I'm living by the power of another kingdom. I'm living by the provision of another kingdom. I'm living by the provision of God providing me with everything I need according to His riches and glory. That's my source in life. And so my source is not the paycheck. It's not the government. It's not this world system. I'm living in a completely different financial kingdom, the kingdom of God. And He is my provider. And so we don't try to serve two masters. We don't try to serve God or money. But we said here, 
you know, as we went through Matthew chapter 6, we, we don't take thought for tomorrow. God loves us and He cares for us. And what do we do? Because we're living in this bigger, better, new kingdom of God, we seek first that kingdom. That's our passion. And all these things are what? Added to us. We're not as the Gentiles who have no God, who have no Heavenly Father providing for them. We don't have to strive and struggle and, you know, cheat and steal and work our way through life to try to obtain. But instead, we seek first the kingdom of God. And God adds whatever we need to us. And so it's a supernatural provision there from our Heavenly Father. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. God has tomorrow under control. We talked about some signs that were under the lordship of money. Covetousness and greed. i got to have more. i got to get more. i got to earn more. Worry and fear. Oh no, what if, what if it all goes away? What are we going to do? What if we come up against a bill we can't pay? Obsession and preoccupation where, you know, getting revenue streams and getting a second and third job and, and sometimes that's necessary. I understand that. But are we obsessed with money? Is it all we think about? Is it all we worry about? Trust and security, you know? Man, if I could win a, the lottery and have a million dollars in the bank, then I would feel, then I could finally relax. No, you get a million dollars in the bank and then a million dollars is not enough. You've got to get more. Plans and strategies, you know? This is how I'm going to invest and this is how I'm going to create different uh, revenue streams. I, I mean, it's, it's, some, it's, it's something that some people, that's all they think about. Not with us. We seek first what? The kingdom. And God adds to us what's needed. The righteous have never been forsaken. They never beg for bread. They seek to live for God and they honor God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and with every breath. And because they honor the Lord, He honors them and provides for every need. The last sign, self-sufficiency and pride. I got life under control. <laughs> yeah, right. Life will beat the snot out of you. You need God. Nobody is self-sufficient. We can't live without Him. And then remember, this is where we ended. God calls us to test Him. God challenges you about this area of finance. And we talked about tithes and offerings last week. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And what? Test me now in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. So as you give, and as you give to the Lord, and as you give in the name of the Lord, and as you give that gift, whether it's going to an organization or a person, as you give out of your heart that offering, it rises before God as a sweet-smelling incense, Paul says. And God will rain down blessings upon you. And then I will rebuke the devourer for you. Things supernaturally last. No wear and tear. Things don't break down. The devourer is rebuked for your sake, which is more money in your pocket in the end. But it's this whole aspect of if we will honor God with generous giving, whether it be to the church or to others in need, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing. And God, through this passage, is speaking to you this morning, and He's saying, put me to the test. Now to transition into what we're talking about today, remember we ended last week with, this, with these comments. Nowhere in the New Testament is the Christian commanded or instructed to tithe. But nowhere in the New Testament is the commandment rescinded either. Okay, so if you're going to say, well, nowhere in the New Testament does it say we have to tithe, you have to also put right along with that to stay balanced. God never revoked it either in the New Testament. 
Jesus clearly states that as New Testament believers, our obedience is to far surpass the obedience of the Old Testament believers. As new creations possessing the heart of regeneration, should we give by compulsion of a rule or a formula, or should we give with glad hearts? And I think we're going to see that even more as we go through these passages. Let's talk for a moment about biblical generosity. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. And I just pray that God really burns this into our hearts this morning. I know I need it. Verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Remember the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is giving instructions to the Corinthian church, and they're doing much like what we're doing for the ladies in Texas. They're, they're getting ready an offering to churches that are in need. There was famine, there was starvation, there was dire need in, in specific regions, and so they're getting this offering together. That, that at this time, the church in Corinth was one of the richest churches around, uh, except for maybe the church in Ephesus. And so he was giving them instructions on how to get this offering together so that they could deliver it to these churches that were in need. And he makes this comment. Remember, there's a need. We want to pool together our funds. And remember, if you give sparingly, you're going to what? Reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you're going to what? Reap bountifully. Do you know how much faith that takes? That takes a lot of faith. When, you, when that money is released from your hands, that is a testimony that you believe God is my source. And I am happy to give this away because when I give this money away, God will provide me with whatever I need. So I don't need to try to hang on to this money and save it for the rainy day or save it for the problem. I can freely give this money because I know God takes care of my tomorrow. I don't have to work, worry about tomorrow. So I'm free to give. I'm not worried about what am I going to do with this missing money now. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart. This is key. And I pray to God that you get it this morning. When you give, God wants you to purpose in your heart what you should give. And that purpose, that decision of the amount you should give cannot come from anybody else. It can't come from me. It can't come from any other organization. You go to God and you hear His voice and between you and the Lord, you decide the amount that you should give. And I think the Lord in the New Testament, I think there's no mention of tithing because we know tithe is 10%. You know, so you earn $100, you give $10 to the Lord, that's the tithe. I really believe in the New Testament, God is wanting us to get away from that formula. Because, you know, tithing, that formula is for those under the law, those that have to live their life by rules. And God doesn't want you to give according to the rules. He wants you to give cheerfully, willingly. And I think God knows that as you give willingly, you're going to give probably more than the 10%. When you truly catch hold of the principles here. So you have to purpose in your heart. And notice, it can't be grudgingly. Well, I guess i got to give this money. It can't be under, what's the next word? Compulsion. Constraint, necessity, or argument. See those meanings there? And I, th I think the body of Christ you know, has really missed it at times. I mean, some, some of these preachers out there are the best fundraisers you could ever find. I mean, they know how to move you emotionally. They know how to try to, to influence you and coerce you in many different manipulative ways. They make you feel guilty for what you have. They can move you with tears full of sympathy. You know those commercials where they, they show the uh, abused animals and they have that very mournful music playing in the background and it just tugs at your heart and their eyes are so big and sad, and right? 
And preachers know how to do that too. It can't be under compulsion. It can't be under any emotional compulsion, any obligatory compulsion. It needs, between, it needs to be a decision between you and God. So you pray, and you decide what God wants you to give. Because He loves a what? A cheerful giver. And what we said last week, the attitude of your heart in the giving is much more important than the dollar amount. So make sure that as you give to the Lord, you're giving what you can give cheerfully because you're honoring God with your giving. You're honoring God because you've purposed in your heart as the result of prayer, as the result of asking Him, Father, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to give? You know, when we hear of, of a need in a certain person and they need some financial help or don't just base, don't just give based upon the emotional tug of your heart. Ask Father, what, what do you want me to do, Father, in this situation? And purpose it between you and your Heavenly Father. And then nobody else is coercing you or compelling you, and you can give it cheerfully, knowing that as Father instructs you to give in this way, He will in turn bless and honor you with provision. Now look at verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for what? For every good deed. So you have an occasion to give here. God has blessed you. And so you're going to return a part of that back to Him in, in the form of a tithe or an offering to the church where God has blessed you and you know your neighbor or friend is in need and so you're going to bless them monetarily with a gift to help them out in their time of trouble. And what this is saying in verse 8, that as you give as unto the Lord, purposing in your own heart, God will see to it that you have an abundance to give the next time. And you don't have to worry about, well, I'm giving up this money, how am I going to survive without it? No, as you give in love and as you give unto the Lord, you will have an abundance for every good deed. God has an endless supply of provision. And you tap into that endless supply every time you have the heart of a giver. Generosity just multiplies in the grace of God. And the more you give, the more you reap, the more you give, God will see to it that you have an abundance for the next good deed, the next opportunity that comes to you. As it is written, he scattereth abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your what? Your seed for sowing. So as you give, and you're casting your seed, and you're giving to others, and, and giving to the ministry, God will multiply your seed so that you can give again. That's why he says there that God has made you rich to establish his covenant. He blesses you to give. He doesn't bless you to keep. He blesses you to be a conduit. He doesn't bless you so that you can build bigger barns. And as you give, God will increase the harvest of your righteousness. Isn't that a great promise? This is where we have to leave the financial system of this earth and we have to step into God's grace and God's provision. We need to leave the dollar bill and this earthly finance behind and we need to step into the heavenly realm of God's financial system. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality. As you give liberally, God will see to it that you can give even more liberally the next time. I put these notes there about biblical generosity. Biblical generosity is your faith in action that God is your source. Because you trust Him to be your provider, I can let go of this money 
I don't have to try to save it up and hoard it because maybe something will happen. No, when something happens, God will be there and he will provide. Biblical generosity is leaving this world system of finance and operating in God's kingdom. Biblical generosity is the conviction that you are blessed to give. You're not blessed to keep. Biblical generosity is giving by faith, not by a formula of 10%. If we give by faith, the percentage will be met and more. And I put there in parentheses, there's nothing wrong with using 10% as a baseline. I know I do in, in my giving. So there's nothing wrong with carrying that over. But I'm just saying, don't let that limit you in any way. Pray and ask Father how he wants you to become generous, not only with your money, but with your time and with your gifts. Biblical generosity really makes the formula of tithing unnecessary because now you're a cheerful giver. You love to give. You're giving liberally. And you're experiencing, as I give liberally, God is causing me to reap liberally. And the process, that miracle process, just continues on and on. This is what we don't want to fall into. You know, what I was stating before when Jesus told them this parable, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Sounds like America. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. The sad part about this is that he felt like, I'm going to build a bigger barn to store all of this stuff. What happened to giving to the poor? Maybe God is blessing you with more so that you can give more. Why do you have to expand and increase? Maybe you're supposed to be a conduit and God wants to flow a provision through you more and more. But that never crossed this guy's mind, did it? He didn't see God as his, as his provider. He thought, somehow i got to save and store. Verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. I don't have to go to the grocery store for the next 10 years. I've got enough in my pension and 401k. Take your ease. Boy, that, that is the kiss of death right there. The absolute worst place you can be in your life is the place where you no longer have to seek God. That's absolutely the worst thing for us. When we no longer have to trust Father for our daily bread. Take your ease. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? You're saving up for what? You're not guaranteed of tomorrow. God will take care of tomorrow. Whether you live or die, God will take care of tomorrow. So today, let's be a liberal giver. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The other place in uh, the New Testament that talks about finance and giving is this place in Philippians. And let me just point out one thing before we close down here. Verse 10, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. You know, the church in Philippi was very dear to Paul's heart. It, it's a very personal level, letter. It's a very affectionate letter. And he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. They had been supporting Paul consistently, and then it stopped for reasons that are somewhat obscure to us, and he's saying, I thank you, I'm glad that you have revived your contributions once again. You were indeed concerned for me, the care never left, but you had no opportunity. And again, that's a little obscure, we don't know what was going on here in the details. Not that I am speaking of being in need, now watch Paul's heart, do you remember over uh, in Corinthians where he's talking about don't give out of compulsion. Paul says here, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatsoever situation I am to be what? Content. Do you see how Paul was cautious here? Uh, he could have laid on the guilt. He could, have, he could have played to their sympathy. I've had to go without. You know, and 
you guys should have been taking care of me all along, and man, I've, I've just been so suffering because I didn't have your financial aid, and, and you should take care of the man of God better than this. He didn't do any of that, did he? Did you, do you see the care in his heart? He said, I want you to understand, I'm not trying to heap guilt on you. I'm not speaking of being in need. Because everything was fine. God's my provider. But now I sure am glad that you, your concern has revived. He says in verse 14, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Probably one reason why they were so dear to his heart. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your what? Read that again. There's fruit that comes to your credit in the heart and mind of God when you give liberally. God takes note. He sees every dollar. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Thank you, Philippi. Your offering is a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. You know why it's acceptable and pleasing to God? Because that's how, that's how he's blessed you. And when you're generous with others, according to how God has been generous with you, God is pleased. That's the heart of God. That honors him. You're saying God has so freely given to me, I'm going to freely give to you. And based upon that, my God will supply every need of you, every need of yours according to his riches and glory. And a lot of times, you know, we quote verse 19 without the context, but it really is healthy to see the context, isn't it? God will supply every need of you, yours, according to his riches and glory as you tap into this supernatural provision of the kingdom of God. And as you begin to share liberally, what God has shared liberally with you, then God will cause you to reap bountifully. Not to keep, but so that you can become even more of a conduit in blessing others. Father, we thank you for your system of finance. And Lord, we're, we are living in a world where this worldly system of finance could collapse any moment. It wouldn't take much. The government just printing more worthless paper called money isn't going to make things any better. It's only going to get worse. And so, Father, we thank you that today we can walk out of church having peace of mind, having every worry and every care addressed by the faithfulness you have demonstrated to your people. The righteous have never been forsaken. The righteous have never begged for bread. If necessary, you'll bring water out of the rock and you'll provide manna from heaven. If necessary, you'll multiply the loaves and the fishes. If necessary, that oil in the cruise will never run out, but there'll be a continuous flow. Father, you have so many ways of providing for our needs far beyond our comprehension or imagination. And you do it so lovingly and tenderly. Teach us, Father, the principle of taking no thought, not even having one worry, but knowing that if you paint each flower in the field and if you take care of every bird that flies, how much more will you take care of us, your children? So, Father, teach us. We don't want to be slaves and, master, and, and under the mastery of money. We want to be slaves to you. We want to seek you with all of our heart. And we know that you will add whatever we need to us. Thank you, Father. We can safely trust in you. And we ask that as we go, we will step in to your heavenly kingdom of provision. Set us free from this worldly financial system. 
set our hearts free from the worry and the fear. And let us know this morning that we can safely trust You with tomorrow. Father, bring us back tonight to worship You again. Keep us safe and give us rest this afternoon. In Jesus' name, Amen.